Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the artists to come out of Eisner and Iger. I know you're familiar with Jack Kirby, uh, Jules Pfeiffer, and Bob Kane. Tell us a little bit about Jack Kirby okay. and his background. Kirby, Kirby was known as the king of comics, um, which is ironic because, Cur uh, well, Victor Fox actually had claimed he was the king of comics back in the day. It was kind of an Edward G. Robinson type. What kind of age range are we talking about between Kirby and Fox? Okay, Fox was probably in his, um, I believe Fox was in his late 30s, mid to late 30s, and Jack was probably about 16. Wow. Um, and Jack actually did work um, in Eisner's shop for a brief time and then went to Fox, ironically. Um, but boy, Jack grew up in the, he was a Jewish kid, grew up in a, the rough, rough spots of um, New York. And he, um, he, was, he was tough. He was a scrapper. There's a story that a mob um, enforcer came to try and collect from Will Eisner. Oh, towels or towels. Yes, towels. And um, short Kirby. Kirby was a short little barrel chested guy. Kirby actually went toe to toe with this big, and again, this is the story. It may not be true, but it's a damn good story. And basically, you know, kind of looked at Will, who was then known as Bill. It's like, you want me to throw this guy out? Is this guy bugging you? And this was a mobster, a bona fide mobster. Could have had, you know, had uh, Jack in cement overshoes. Um, Jack scared the mobster off. Short little. Daddy Jack Kirby, who was probably about this tall. Now, how, you know, how true is I guess this story? So. This, this sounds like one of those things we're talking about you before know, we came on air. I don't, know if, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a great story. And that's the beauty of comics history. Is you, Some of it, you know, my job is to prove whether things are true or not. Um, but gosh, there's some things I don't want to disprove because they're so much fun. Um, but Kirby later went and worked at Fox and actually drew the Blue Beetle comic strip. And there he met Fox's first editor, um, a guy named uh, Joe Simon. Well, Simon and um, Kirby started moonlighting, and they did some comics for um, Wiz Comics, actually. Also, they did Captain America for Timely, which is now known as Marvel Comics. Mm -hmm. That was the first incarnation of Marvel, correct? Yes, it was. It was founded by Martin Goodman, um, whose nephew, Stanley Lieber, started as an office boy when Simon and Kirby were doing Captain America at, Fo uh, at uh, Timely. And what's funny is that, that Stan, Stanley, or Stan as we know him now, played an oboe a lot. And he would sit in the corner and play this oboe. And Kirby could, could just not stand the oboe. Um, anyway, Stan was the office boy. They sent him on errands, whatever. Um, he was, of course, the nephew of the owner of Timely Comics. And Timely was not only Martin, but it was his you know, his family as well. Um, Simon and Kirby had started moonlighting for other companies and, um, you know, and they had staff positions at Timely. Well, Goodman caught wind of it and then sat there and made them finish the final issue of Captain America, which for them was number 11, um, and then kicked him out. Um, but Kirby always suspected, at least at that time, suspected it was Stan Lee, as we now know him, um, of who wants to be a superhero fame. And uh, rumor has it that, you know, he told Simon, he's like, I'm going to kill that damn kid. Where is he? You know, because he thought Stan ratted him out. Um, but later on, Jack went back um, to Marvel with Stan and co-created Fantastic Four. Um, I think he designed Iron Man, the Avengers, Thor. Uh, we basically owe not only the, the language of superhero comics, um, which, you know, Simon and Kirby had started back in the 1940s, the splash page, the wide panels, but we also owe the modern superhero um, in very, very much towards Kirby. I think Kirby deserves as much um, credit as Stan Lee does. Now, in the, in the early years, it seems like that they were, from what I read and doing some background on this, there were a lot of reprints of strips that were running in national newspapers, mm -hmm. and that was how comics got their start. But by the time you get to Jack Kirby and Jules Pfeiffer and Bob Kane, they're creating original content, true? Yes, yes. And it, it did start as a reprint house. Um, all right, well, you know, in general, there were reprints of strips. Um, but then eventually, I believe it was um, a knockoff Dick Tracy strip called um, Detective Dan, I believe. Don't quote me on that. But this one publisher decided, hey, well, why should I bother paying all these royalties to publish known strips when I can just have my own made hmm. for less? Smart business. It was a very smart business move. And because of that, you had people um, like Bob Kane, who was 16. Um, you know, Will Eisner was very young. Same with Kirby. A lot of your Golden Age artists were kids, basically. 
they were hired for next to nothing to, to create these knockoff strips. Um, you know, like Zatara was a knockoff of Mandrake the Magician. Um, you know, I mean, all these characters were just ripoffs, basically, of popular comic strip characters, but they were so much cheaper to produce. So, you know, you had these, these kids basically drawing these very crude comic strips, especially Fox Comics. Fox, they were known for having horribly drawn strips. Um, so would it be safe to call these kind of like early fan artists? In a sense, or no? you know, that's a good way to put it. Um, I mean, they're young. They're yeah, doing what a lot of fan artists today would do. They were, I would say, they were the first because a comic strip came into vogue by the 1930s. Um, with the Great Depression, people, you know, many people went to see movies, but they didn't have quite the money that they did, you know, in the gay. Oh, okay, <laughs> the uh, Roaring Twenties. Um, so the comic strip was an inexpensive storytelling medium. Um, and you did get your first generation of fans. You know, Flash Gordon premiered in 1930s, Dick Tracy. Um, we really owe a lot to that decade as far as pop culture goes. Here's a question for you. So who was reading this, these comics at that time between, say, 38 and by the end of World War II? What was their audience? Was it, was it teenage boys or was this more of an adult audience? Who was, who That's was a good question. Um, and it's an interesting question. You, you mentioned World War II as a drop-off point. Kids, basically, Jules Spifer started reading comic books. Um, and he later became an assistant for Will Eisner and as we all know, just an amazing cartoonist and writer. Um, <clears throat> many of them were, were kids at first. And then when we hit World War II, we had um, a lot of propaganda in comics. You know, Captain America actually was the first comic book to say, to use the Nazis as villains. Um, Adolf Hitler was punched out on the front cover, which came out the month Pearl Harbor was attacked, ironically. Um, but one of the things that, that was being done to boost trooper morale was that like DC Comics, for instance, sent, uh, I believe, half their circulation overseas. And so a lot of um, GIs were being exposed to comic books, a lot of your soldiers overseas. And as a result, gradually comics started to kind of cater towards them. So you had what were called um, your headlight comics, which were much, much saucier comics with, um, you know, women in bondage and, and okay, hardly well, wearing anything. Like well, yeah, I mean, you, know, you had, um, you know, Blue Beetle, of course, fell into it. Um, EC Comics um, were so huge. So their audience the was primarily men age 30 and under, safe to say. Well, I'd say 30 is probably pushing it. I'd say probably up to about... 23, 24, but that's, you know, kids were still reading comics at that point. It's just that publishers were starting to kind of, kind of cater slightly towards an older audience and some kids kind of picked up with it as well. So they created these comics, uh, Eisner and Iger, with artists like Jack Kirby, Jules Pfeiffer, Bob Kane, uh, in New York, then they were distributed somehow nationally at that time, or was this more regional? Well, I would, I would say nationally. Um, in the case of Eisner and Iger, Eisner actually left Iger when he started The Spirit, which was, um, Spirit was a, an eight-page comic book that was a Sunday supplement. Mm -hmm. um, and Kane had worked from very early on in the game. Um, but, you know, DC Comics later had their own staff. Um, same with Timely, um, as we now know in Marvel. Um, basically, it was a newsstand distribution. We don't have a newsstand distribution anymore, meaning, um, well, for, we really don't have newsstands. Today, it would be, you know, your 7-Elevens, your grocery stores. Uh, that's no longer really out there. Uh, but back then, the newsstand was the only place you went to. There were no comic book stores. Now, how about another one of these artists, Bob Kane? What can you tell us about Bob, Bob Kane? Kane? Robert Kahn is his name. And um, Bob actually was a contemporary of Will's. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> the stories about Bob Kane. Um, Bob has been credited as the creator of Batman, the sole creator of Batman. There was a writer named um, Bill Finger who actually wrote Batman's first appearance in Detective Comics number 27, which was 1939. And um, Finger was credited as coming up with the utility belt, um, the distinctive cowl, the mask that Batman wears. Um, Bob Kane had originally designed Batman with a, what's called a domino mask, which is actually what Robin, you know, Batman's sidekick, wears. Um, but Finger was a brilliant writer, brilliant crime writer, and many argue that he co-created Batman. Well, Kane took full credit. Um, his byline was on Batman from the get-go, and he had a father who had 
who basically made sure that Bob was taken care of with DC Comics. So Bob was very, very savvy. I would say he was at best a workable artist, but not very good. He started out doing what were called Bigfoot comics, um, which were funny animals. And he reinvented himself to do Batman as, um, by basically kind of knocking off um, Chester Gould, who drew Dick Tracy, which was then the most popular crime strip. Um, but very soon, by the 40s, I mean, Bob Kane wasn't even drawing Batman at all, but he was signing his name to it, even through the 60s. Um, there's a story that there were clown paintings that Bob Kane put out in the 1960s to kind of cash in on the pop art craze uh, that the Batman TV show had created. And there's actually a rumor, uh, you know, again, I'm not claiming any of this is 100% true because I don't have evidence, but it's hearsay that he actually hired someone to ghost paint the clown paintings that he had his name on. So, you know. But Kane, love him or hate him, you've got to give Kane credit because he actually created, with Batman, he and Bill Finger took all of the right elements, um, like Dick Tracy, the shadow, and they threw him together into this, this incredible creation who's become, um, I would say, a mythological archetype, much like, you know, his other counterpart, Superman. Had.